A report from the charity Oxfam has predicted that the richest 1% of the world's population will hold more wealth than the other 99% by the end of next year. The research found that five years ago the world's richest 1% shared 44% of the world's wealth. That has risen to around 48% and the charity says it expects the figure to reach 50% in 2016. The findings were published to coincide with the start of the World Economic Forum in Davos, which attracts the top political and business leaders from around the world. Well, joining us now from London is Rachel Orr, the head of the UK Poverty Programme for Oxfam, and Ben Southwood, who is from the Adam Smith Institute. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, Rachel Orr, what's the scale of this inequality? What, what our research today shows is that uh economic inequality is extreme uh, and it's getting worse. So right now, the richest 80 people in the world own the same amount of wealth as the poorest three and a half billion. That's the poorest half of the people who live on the planet. Um, and, and this explosion of economic inequality is seriously hampering our efforts to tackle poverty uh, and extreme poverty around the world. Uh, ben Southwood, you don't think inequality is the issue? Well, I don't think inequality is the issue, but even if we go away from that, um, I just don't think these numbers show us what they think they show us. They're net wealth numbers. That means they look at assets minus debt. But they don't count every asset. They don't count the assets of such things like a good education. So, for example, um, an Ivy League lawyer who's moving into um, a New York law firm and he's going to be earning hundreds of thousands of dollars a year will be one of the poorest people in the world on this measure because he has student debt. Michael Jackson, before he died, was one of the poorest people in the world. In fact, of the t bottom 10% um, on Oxfam's numbers, 7.5% of them come from the USA. That's almost as many as India, the poorest big country in the world. I don't think these numbers tell us what they think they tell us. And if we look at other numbers, like inequality of income, we're seeing that the world is getting more and more equal. Uh, Rachel, or your figures are wrong. <laughs> We have based our research on uh, data from Credit Suisse, which is uh, widely recognised to be uh, the most accurate uh, data um, of, of wealth in the world. And if the Adam Smith Institute would, would like to collect some alternative data um, and work with Oxfam in terms of, of looking into that, we'd, we'd be very interested in doing so. And, but I think Ben's point is important because this isn't just about uh, uh, inequality of income. It's actually about inequality of wealth. Um, and what we're seeing is this real concentration of wealth in the hands of the very few and, and that concentration is getting greater and greater which is leaving more and more people further and further behind. Ben? Well, actually that sounds like a fun project um, but I think that the problem with these figures, as I say, is it judges certain people who seem to be rich on every common sense standard of wealth as, as being very poor. Um, so what we want to do is not just look at income but we could look at inequality of lifespan which is declining drastically. We could look at the number of people living on one dollar a day, declining drastically, hundreds of millions leaving that category. The number on, the proportion on two dollar a day, from in the 80s it was about 70 percent, now it's about 40 percent, and that's, that's real dollars, so it's, it's, it doesn't, inflation doesn't impact that. Uh, so Rachel, why does inequality matter if, as Ben says, uh, poverty is improving? Well, I think that um, we've made huge strides uh, in, in the last 20 years in terms of tackling poverty and tackling extreme poverty around the world. But actually, that's why it's so important that we're looking at growing inequality now, because um, we think, and it's not just Oxfam, it's, it's people like Christine Lagarde at the IMF, it's people like Barack Obama, like Pope Francis, who are saying, unless we do something about inequality now, we threaten to undermine all of that progress and indeed um, to start going backwards, because this, this kind of gross economic inequality um, is not just bad for poverty reduction, it's also bad for growth. Ben, bad for growth, uh, it, it doesn't make economic sense. Well, I think we're getting confused about within-country inequality and across-country inequality. On basically every measure except for these figures which I believe are flawed, between-country inequality is going down. China, just, just think about it, China comp now compared to 30 years ago, India now compared to 30 years ago, Indonesia now compared to 30 years ago. All these countries getting richer much faster than we are. Um, in some, on some measures, you know, some of, the, some of the wealthy world isn't doing that well at all. So in a, within, between the global inequality is going down on basically every measure except for this one. Within country inequality is what Christine Lagarde is talking about and that might be bad on some measures. Some people think within country inequality leads to worse growth or whatever. But one of the main reasons they think within country inequality leads to worse growth is because when you 
have within country inequality. You want to raise taxes on the rich. And according to these studies, that reduces growth. So that, that, that's one of the main reasons why within country inequality is supposed to reduce growth. The solution to it we're proposing is raise taxes. I'm not sure if that makes sense. Rachel. Seven out of ten people in the world live in countries where uh, inequality is growing and that is threatening to leave more and more people further and further behind. I mean, take Scotland for example, that the poorest ten the richest 10% of households in Scotland are 900 times wealthier than the poorest 10%. And in terms of uh, equality of, of opportunity, equality of outcome, uh, in terms of the types of opportunities that exist for people, that is not the same. That is not a level playing field. And we're very concerned that all of the progress that we've made to really to make these massive steps to reduce poverty are, are threatened to be undermined. You have suggested a, a, a seven-point plan. How, how do you implement that across a global economy, though? Um, it's definitely not an easy thing to do, but I think that the chorus of voices of, of you know, people saying that this kind of economic inequality is, is disastrous for the world that we live in, we have an economic imperative, we have a moral imperative to do something about it, and that kind of pressure is something that, that world leaders can't ignore. So um, Oxfam is at the Economic Forum uh, in Davos today, this week, um, kind of really putting pressure on, on leaders at a global level, but then also we want to work with governments within countries. So um, it, it, in Scotland, a Across the UK, um, talking about uh, policies that are more progressive, that, that don't hamper growth, but look at how we can share the proceeds of that growth fairly and more equally across the country. Uh, ben, notwithstanding your doubts about the actual figures, is that a realistic prospect? I mean, it's a hard thing to do, but one point I'd like to drive home is just how wealthy, even the poor people in, in the UK and the USA is a, is a good example because I have good numbers on them, are compared to the rest of the world. The poorest 5% in the USA are richer than 68% of the world. To get in this global 1% that we're talking about for wealth, you need to, you need to own a house about, worth about 500 to 530,000 pounds in the UK. Now that's an expensive house, but that still puts about 5 million Brits um, in, in the global 1%. These aren't CEOs and oil shakes we're talking about. These are middle class people or upper middle class people in the UK. Now, um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't, we should, we shouldn't I'm care afraid about it, I'm afraid at that point we've run out of time, and at that point I'm afraid we'll have to leave it. But Ben, Rachel, thank you both for joining us. Thanks. Thank you.